Square Live from Bloomers World Headquarters in Midtown Manhattan. I'm Matt Miller. And I'm Kaylee Lyons. Welcome to a special extended edition of Bloomberg Crypto, a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance, which has been shaken to its core this week. Yeah, we are focused on one man in particular today, Sam Bankman Freed, the fallen crypto mogul whose troubled FTX exchange may have to seek bankruptcy if it doesn't get a rescue. We'll have the latest on the rapidly evolving story and talk about potential ripple effects across the industry with Anthony Trenchev, the co-founder of rival exchange Nexo. Plus, we'll discuss the regulatory ramifications with SEC Commissioner Hester Pierce and Bloomberg's Matt Levine joins us as well with his take on the whole debacle. All right, so all of that is ahead. First, though, let's get a snapshot of the market. The best way to do that on your Bloomberg terminal, CRYP Go. That is your function. And while it has been a brutal week for crypto pretty much across the board today in tandem with other risk assets thanks to a cooler than expected CPI print we are seeing a massive rebound Bitcoin is up about nine and a half percent we are back north of seventeen thousand dollars ether is up 14 percent and then FTT the native token for FTX has literally doubled on the day to 366 but remember last Friday it was up north of twenty five dollars so that just gives you a sense of how far it has fallen as all of this has unfolded over recent days and then Coinbase another rival exchange up about 9% on the day. And of course, today is an interesting anniversary, Matt, because it is November 10th, 2022. On November 10th, 2021, that was the intraday record high for Bitcoin. Remember when we were out almost the 70,000 level? Now we're down at 17,000, down 75% over the course of just a year. How far we have fallen, mm. how quickly, Matt? Well, true, but I also remember when we were at the $75 level for Bitcoin. <laughs> In any case, uh, ripples across the financial world, not limited to just the effect on Bitcoin. You can see this is a chart of Tether um, that we have broken the buck, so to speak, come down below a dollar. Of course, it's been up above a dollar as well, but this kind of volatility um, comes with a, with a, a cryptocurrency um, that normally stays exactly at $1. At the peg, it's what it's designed to do. This has also hurt Sam Bankman Fried's personal fortune. As far as we estimate, he has been worth as much as $25 billion, more recently um, valued by Bloomberg at $15 billion, but lost all of that in just about one day. Here's what Sam Bankman Fried has told Bloomberg in the past about his company's profitability and growth. We have uh, you know, a few billion on our balance sheet right now. We are profitable. We're in a relatively strong place from a financial perspective. I want to be doing something net positive, like with the, the making money part, like, like I, I want to be a good actor there. We've raised a few billion dollars over the course of the last, uh, last couple of years and we're a profitable business. And with Voyager, I think you know there's 70 million dollars there that 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 we put in that I th I'm not sure we're ever seeing that 70 million again. We've not used the majority of the cash that we have on our, our balance sheet. We want to be flexible. We want to be in a position where we are uh, you know looking forward at uh, you know what we can be doing, where we can be most helpful, um, and where we can grow the most. I'm excited about a pathway forward. I'm really excited about our leadership. That's all the recent past, but let's focus right now on Bankman uh, Freed's present. The latest reporting from Reuters says SBF is seeking a $9.4 billion package for an FTX bailout. Bloomberg Shanali Basak is going to be joining us for the entire hour today, and she has the latest on the state of play. Shanali, what do we know? Uh, we know that the FTX was not only one of the biggest crypto exchanges, Matt, it was also seeking to bail out other struggling crypto firms across the industry while Sam Bankman Fried was actively trying to change policies in the United States around digital asset regulation. Now, the unwinding of his firms leaves about billions of dollars at risk for clients and investors, with some of the largest ones in Singapore, Japan, Canada, and the U.S. collectively pouring almost $2 billion into FTX venture rounds in a mere six months coming into this year. It was valued at $32 billion in January, and now investors risk losing it all. Roll forward to today. FTX is facing probes by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, the CFTC, and the Department of Justice. Authorities and regulators are investigating whether FTX has mishandled customer funds and seeking to unravel the ties between FTX and the rest of Sam Bankman Fried's empire. Now, many of the concerns surfaced on Friday after Coindesk reported billions of dollars worth of ties between FTX and Alameda. The trade 
trading firm run by Sam Bankman-Fried. And the major concern here was that FTT, a token issued by FTX, had accounted for a large chunk of the balance sheet at SBF's trading firm. Over the weekend, the CEO of Binance said he would start selling the FTT tokens that he owned, and that was about a half a billion dollars worth. But the token was under so much pressure, and issues really mounted here at a faster pace for FTX and SBF. Within days, the Binance CEO said he signed a letter of intent to acquire FTX, given the liquidity issues, but the value of the FTT token was crashing at that time. FTX is now facing a hole in its own balance sheet of about $8 billion. A person familiar with the matter told Bloomberg's Jillian Tan. Famed venture capital firm Sequoia has written down its investment to zero, and it's an indication that others might do the same. The Wall Street Journal reported on Thursday that about $16 billion of customer assets at FTX, of those funds, about half were lent to the Alameda trading firm. SBF says on Twitter today that Alameda is winding down its trading operations and that he's in talk with investors to raise liquidity to make investors whole again. For FTX, primarily these are clients, people who had their accounts with FTX and other investors, he says, come next in line to get paid back. All right, Shanali, really great big breakdown. Thank you so much. The latest headline now crossing the Bloomberg is that Justin Sun, the founder of Tron, says he is in fundraising talks with FTX, though he declined to comment on the amount to Bloomberg News. So we'll continue to monitor the headlines. Let's now, though, get the take of Bloomberg opinion columnist Matt Levine. He recently penned a 40,000-word essay in Business Week titled The Crypto Story. And Matt, how quickly the crypto story seems to have changed over the course of just a couple days. You've spoken exclusively exclusively with SBF. You had a long sit down with him at the Bloomberg Crypto Summit over the summer. What is your take on this? Uh, I'm sad for him. I like I like SBF. I think he, you know, my impression was he was a good actor in crypto and he um, he was very he was always very candid and, and interesting to talk to um, in ways that, uh, you know, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry we're not hearing more from him now as this goes on. I'm sure he'll want to speak uh, more. You have been, though, skeptical of crypto in your columns. Do you think this is um, a difficult blow for the entire industry? Is this a Lehman Brothers moment for crypto? Oh, I think so. I mean, I, it's, it's really bad. It's really bad for one of the biggest firms, but also one of the most high-profile firms, a firm that sort of seemed like a good actor and, you know, wanted better regulation. For that firm to implode in, in the blink of an eye is very much undermines confidence in the business. Um, you know, a Lehman moment is bad. There, there are people talking about this being the end of crypto, which I think would be, uh, you know, considerably worse than a Lehman moment, right? Well, if it is the end of the crypto industry, I mean, what evidence do we have around that, given that some of these tokens are back up? Oh, yeah. To be clear, I don't think that. But it is, I think, uh, very much sort of tough for, for investors to be confident that even, like, the most confidence-inspiring exchange is, is going bankrupt in the blink of an eye. Well, we thought it was the white knight, right? He was stepping yeah. in to rescue everybody else after the first seemingly life-altering crypto implosion in May of this year when Terra USD collapsed, and now he needs his own white knight. So we can talk about if it gets rescued, what the implications are, but what if it doesn't? I mean, if it doesn't, then probably customers will lose a fair amount of money at, at FTX. I don't know what the odds of a rescue are. I mean, like, one thing that happened in the summer is that there was one source of rescue financing in crypto. There was right. FTX. And when exchanges and, and you know, lending companies got in trouble, they went to FTX for a bailout. Now that's gone, and the place that FTX went to for a bailout that quickly unraveled. So it's sort of a bad sign for, like, the ability of the Well, they went to, to uh, Binance yeah. for a bailout. Binance essentially started this whole thing, right? I mean, yeah. CZ tweeted that he was going to sell his FTT tokens. That seems like a clearly planned move to bring down the value of FTT, as odd as that, uh, oh, yeah. as odd as that move is. It's extremely strange that you would want to telegraph that you're selling something and then drive down the value of this thing before you've sold it. Uh, look, I mean... Unless you're trying to do damage to a yeah, competitor. Yeah, I mean, I, like Sam Bankman-Fried's tweets and his emails to employees suggest that he thinks that Binance was intentionally knifing FTX, and yeah. that, that is kind of what it looks like. So you mentioned that customers potentially could lose all their money here. That's not a non-zero chance of that happening. I don't know about all their money, but... 
or a significant amount. And we also, via Bloomberg reporting, have learned that he was using their money to fund his trading firm. I mean, realistically, with your background as an attorney, is he going to go to prison? I mean, what are the legal ramifications here? I don't know, and I don't know what the terms of this of, of, of his arrangements with customers are. I mean, like one thing that is happening here is that uh, this is not like an exchange where you just put your money in a box and the exchange holds on to your to your money for you. It's also it's essentially a brokerage, a prime broker, and so he's you know FTX is providing financing to its customers. And one thing that means is that it can use customer assets to get financing for customer assets. And so what it looks like what looks like happened is that Alameda borrowed money from FTX, secured by collateral. The collateral might have been FTT, it might not have been that good. So it might have been a permissible but sort of so a gray area. Dicey, yeah. Here, here's a simpler question than the, the the larger question at play about the funds here tokenization all of this is surrounding a token that they made yeah. and then used as collateral uh, is there any evidence here that the sec would have to put a clamp down on tokens at large they've been trying i mean certainly if i were the sec i would say you know like it seems clear to me that the ftg token sort of looks like a security um it's it's essentially stock in 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 like the ftx business and uh you know if if customers are losing money on it is essentially a security investment, then sure, the SEC should be interested. I mean, well, they're in the Bahamas, right? And this right. isn't the U.S. arm of their exchange. Right. I'm not saying the SEC doesn't ever reach further than our borders. But my question for the crypto industry would be, can this happen somewhere else? We've seen these huge failures at Three Arrows, at uh, Terra, uh, Luna, and now at FTX. Um, do we have any assurance that we can safely do business with Coinbase or with Binance? Or are they too, um, you know, gambling with customers' money and issuing their own tokens that they accept then as collateral? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that you should, in general, this is very much bad news for confidence in the industry generally because the exchange that looked good is not. Um, I think that uh, uh, the opacity in the industry is a big problem. Like FTX, which seems like a sort of transparent, regulated actor, doesn't like publish balance sheets, and we don't really know what it's doing with its money. Uh, I do think Coinbase is a little different. You know, I'm I'm sort of biased towards U.S. securities regulation, and I think one thing that is happening here is that U.S. securities regulation looks pretty good. Coinbase publishes audited balance sheets. I think that's probably helpful for customers. But yeah, I mean, if I were a, a crypto customer, I'd be very worried about any exchange. Finally, Matt, when you were on with us last after that 40,000-word Business Week piece, we made you answer a bunch of questions uh, with one word answer. We asked if you believe in crypto. You said, sure. Does that answer change after this week? Oh, yeah. I don't think that this, I don't think that this actually undermines like crypto as a concept. I think that for a long time in crypto, there was this view that exchanges were all sort of shady operators and kept getting hacked and losing money. And, you know, Crypto was, was, you know, dealt with that problem. Like, that was a, a thing that happened, but people still invested in crypto. I think there's a little bit of that now, again, where, like, a lot of the big centralized crypto firms are turning out to, be, to go bust one day. But um, that doesn't really undermine the case for crypto. It just makes it hard for investors to be confident that their money is safe. Even after Lehman Brothers, we still believed in the U.S. dollar. Yeah, right? I mean, like, the asset is separate from, like, the ecosystem of big companies that trade it. Ben, great having you on the show. Thanks so much for joining us again at such short notice. Matt Levine of Bloomberg Opinion. Shanali Basic stays with us for the hour. Coming up, who could be the next to fall? We'll discuss the FTX ripple effects with Anthony Trenchev, the co-founder of rival exchange Nexo. And we'll dig into regulation with Republican SEC Commissioner Hester Pierce and Perry Ann Boring, the CEO of Trade Group Chamber of Digital Commerce. Plus, Kraken co-founder Jesse Powell has spoken to FTX but doesn't want to get involved. More on that ahead. We have spoken to them um, about this and, you know, we're, we're in the loop and, um, you know, we're looking to get more information at this point. But, you know, I don't think there's going to be value there, anything close to what the whole seems to be. is very high for contagion. If this exchange cannot reopen, it's the impact, the knock-on effects are going to reverberate all throughout the entire crypto space. And it might even start to leak into the traditional financial space. This is going to probably 
cause a review and a rethink as to how one should be investing in this space as we go forward. Will crypto get through this? Yes, crypto will get through this. But this is going to be a, a very tough slog. It can get very, very dark before the skies break and things get better. Jim Bianco of Bianco Research speaking earlier about the future of crypto. Joining us to talk more about this is Nexo co-founder and managing partner, Anthony Trenchev. Uh, uh, he operates a rival exchange, uh, it's fair to say. Anthony, what do you think about this um, dramatic blow up? How bad is it for the entire industry? Well, it is a very serious situation. There's no beating around the bush. Um, I think that any sort of rescue, whether it's an acquisition or a liquidity injection at FTX will be extremely tough. We are engaged in a similar, much, much smaller scale transaction. And I know what that takes, uh, you know, Binance looking at it for 24 hours and then deciding to walk away. The hole that started at two billion is now uh, reportedly up at uh, $8 billion. So, you know, we need a person or a company that has $8 billion to spare and that sees value in FTX. And uh, whether we have such a person, does he exist and who that is, I don't have a great answer to those questions, unfortunately. Well, it looks like they've reached out to, uh, well, I guess anybody, but um, we're seeing Justin Tr uh, Sun from Tron, for example, um, reportedly willing to chip in a billion and some other investors as well. Have they reached out to you? Is Nexo willing to participate in a bailout of FTX? Well, they haven't reached out. Um, I would be extremely cautious because, uh, you know, all of the information that is out there, uh, clients' funds being lent out to the trading arm, which is Alameda, uh, there are serious concerns around, around what um, uh, uh, unfolded there. So, you know, any sort of deal to be closed out, I wish I could be more optimistic on its prospects, but uh, quite frankly, I'm not. What about Nexo's prospects? What's the risk or likelihood of something like this happening to you? Well, to us, this is business as usual. We have zero exposure to uh, FTX Alameda and all their affiliates. Uh, we withdraw all of our balances. Uh, the team is working around the clock, making sure that uh, all transactions are uh, uh, processed in real time as they should be or close to real time. Uh, this is not the first crisis that we've seen and we have safeguarded the enterprise uh, against, uh, you know, any possible contagion. Uh, we did something uh, last year. We pioneered a real-time audit with a uh, third-party independent auditor, and we have real-time proof that our assets exceed liabilities at all times. We have uh, challenged the industry for more players to do the same. Kraken listened. Um, they did the same. You know, this is right now the talk of the town. Everybody is talking finally about uh, proof of reserves, real-time auditing. And I think this is one of the ways uh, yeah. forward um, uh, that could uh, drive uh, uh, the, the space um, uh, out of this mess. So clearly some trust needs to be rebuilt. What are you hearing from your clients? Because presumably some of them may have had money with different exchanges other than Nexo. I mean, what's the bleed through here? Well, it's difficult to uh, to assess uh, so early uh, after this whole thing happened. Obviously, our hearts, my heart and the, the team's hearts go out to everybody who is directly or indirectly affected. Uh, you know, we are trying to be uh, part of the solution here, processing just transactions so that people can restructure their financing. What we are hearing across the market is that there are basically two type of categories of market participants. You know, Nexo, Kraken, Coinbase, Blockchain.com, all those companies that came out and said we have no exposure here. There are some companies that came out and said we do have exposure here and it's better to be transparent about it. So, and there is a third category, which is companies that remain awkwardly silent about uh, whether they do have uh, uh, exposure to FTX and Alameda. And I don't think we have yet seen the full uh, uh, second order effects of uh, this meltdown mm -hmm. uh, of FTX and Alameda. Please elaborate on that. You know, Jim Bianco of Bianco Research, who we heard from a little earlier, had said to me dozens of firms could fail because they do have accounts with FTX. They may not get their money back. They may also have to figure out other ways to make their own shortfalls whole. 
how far does the contagion go? Or they could be counterparties to Alameda. Let's yeah, not forget absolutely. how big that risk is. Yeah, there's Alameda here too. Yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to, to, to measure the, the contagion potential. What we have heard is a, a number of different market maker, makers, hedge funds that have, uh, you know, anywhere between 5 and 25, 30% of their assets on FTX. I don't think it's all gone. There appear to be some assets uh, uh, in both entities, so they will not be losing like 100% hopefully not, uh, but they will, there will be significant uh, uh, write-offs and ultimately what that means for the general public, uh, whether th this will be only retail investors or uh, uh, only institutional investors, mm. but there are also retail investors. Uh, we'll just have to wait out and see. Anthony, uh, CZ tweeted out one lesson. The first lesson to take from this is don't accept your own token as collateral. Do you do that at Nexo? Uh, I think what he actually said is a little different. He said that companies should not borrow against their own collateral, essentially what FTX and Alameda has been doing. We do not do that. We accept Nexo as collateral for client loans with a very low uh, loan-to-value ratio. I think it is around 15% currently. It varies a little bit uh, okay. uh, uh, depending on, on liquidity, but no, we do not do that, and we are uh, in line with here with CZ's opinion. All right, Anthony Trenchev of Nexo, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your insight on such a crazy week in this space. And coming up, the largest stable coin by market value is veering off its peg from the U.S. dollar. We'll have more on the state of Tether next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Crypto. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller. Matt, I just want to take a moment on Tether because remember when Terra USD blew up? Everyone we talked to said, well, it's algorithmic. You can't associate this with an asset backed stablecoin like Tether. Yet we're seeing Tether breaking its peg from the dollar in recent days. I mean, what significance does that have? Yeah, not so stable, right, as a stablecoin should be. It is worth noting that we haven't seen huge swings. It's still uh, within half a cent of a dollar and has gone over the value of a dollar as well. But uh, definitely not good if you want to keep um, your stable coins stable at exactly one dollar. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see what this means for the fate of stable coins more broadly and whether or not they actually can serve a role like a, a central bank run digital currency could. So that's something we will continue uh, to talk about in coming episodes of Bloomberg. Yeah, we will continue to uh, harp on this. Coming up more on the regulatory ramifications with SEC Commissioner Hester Pierce. This is Bloomberg. from Bloomer's World Headquarters in Midtown Manhattan. I'm Matt Miller. And I'm Kaylee Lyons. Welcome back to a special extended edition of Bloomberg Crypto, a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. And really, when we say people, we mean one person in particular. We're talking about this week, Sam Bankman-Fried and FTX. And we have some breaking news from FTX crossing the wire right now, Matt. FTX US says trading may be halted in a few days. It says that withdrawals withdrawals are and will remain open, telling customers to close down any positions that they want to. But again, and Shanali Basik is here with us as well. They say trading may be halted in a few days, Shanali. And remember, FTX US was not initially part of the deal that involved Binance. We'll see if there's anything else that will involve FTX US as they seek to shore out these firms. But again, now this is firmly also a US exchange issue. It's also a very black box, which is part of the problem, right? We don't understand exactly what happened at FTX.com yet, and we don't know how connected FTX US is. Maybe they have a similar problem in terms of a capital shortfall. The other thing is, we're not 100% sure about the jurisdiction of US yeah. regulators. Um, you would assume that they have jurisdiction over FTX US, but we're not clear 
on whether they have jurisdiction over FDX.com or SBF, who is sitting, of course, in the Bahamas. Yeah, and we're going to have more on the regulatory conversation in just a moment. First, though, we want to talk about potential macro ramifications. Peter Cheer of Academy Securities was on Bloomberg Television earlier today talking about how he expects the contagion to ripple through other asset classes. What does this do for the economy slightly longer term? You're going to see less spending on semiconductor chips, right? They were huge buyers for these mining rigs for all the software that they needed. You're going to see um, less ad spending, right? We might finally be able to get through a sporting event without Matt Damon telling us to, you know, march off to do something exciting. And finally, I think we're going to see less energy use as mining drops. So there's going to be a lot of real world repercussions from this. So that's a take on the macro picture, but really the only macro picture the market seems to be focused on today, focused on today X crypto is that of cooler inflation here in the U.S., which is why we are seeing a big rally in risk across the board, but especially equities. The S&P 500 up 4.4 percent, the Nasdaq 100 up 6 percent on the day. This is the best single day for that big tech heavy index going back to the spring of 2020. Of course, what's helping out big tech stocks is the fact that yields are sinking lower. We're down 23 basis points on the 10-year Treasury yield to 385, while the dollar is dramatically weaker on the day. The Bloomberg dollar index down about 1.6 percent. As for how that is translating into the crypto space, it's been a really bad week. Today, though, a little bit of a rebound. Bitcoin up 10 percent. We are back north of $17,000. Ether is at $1,257 or so, up about 14 percent on the day. And then FTX token, FTT, which of course is the native token of FTX, up 137 percent. But that only gets us to 432 when we we're up north of 25 about a week ago, so keep that in mind. And then another exchange, Coinbase, up about 9% on the day, Matt. So clearly there has been a lot of volatility in this space over the last several days. Yeah, but I think really it's the uh, CPI numbers that are helping not only um, traditional finance, but also crypto markets absolutely rip face today. Let's focus, though, on the continued turmoils in crypto, really ramping up pressure on regulators to step in. Market events over the past couple of days have just been shocking. Continue to reverberate across crypto markets and beyond. What we also have seen over these last six or eight months of different bits of turmoil in the crypto market, lack of disclosure, opacity. From three arrows to Voyager to Celsius Network, mm -hmm. we've seen a continuous stream of events. Strong and robust risk management must be at the core of all of these firms in the crypto space. We've been working directly with uh, bipartisan bills to ensure that we can develop a regulatory framework. The U.S. regulators need to use the tools and the existing authorities to protect investors and ensure market integrity and market stability. Without those types of strong protections in place, you might see more instances like this happen. The investing public is hoping for a better future, uh, uh, and, and they're not having it here. All right, we heard from a lot, a lot of regulators there. Let's talk to one more. SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce joins us now. Thanks so much, Commissioner, for your time. Let me first ask you about the question of jurisdiction. Um, if you can, uh, I guess, agree that FTT, FTX's token, um, is a security, would you be able to step into a business that's outside the borders of the U.S. operated from the Bahamas? I'm not going to uh, speculate about whether or not we have jurisdiction over any of the events going on at the moment. I think the, the, the questions around lack of jurisdictional clarity are partly our fault because we've had opportunities. We've been asked time and again to provide more clarity about where our, where our jurisdiction lies, and we've not done so. And, and mm. that's part of the reason we, that you all have the questions that you have right now. Well, we just heard from Republican Senator Pat Toomey, who put out in a tweet that the crypto sector has been operating with far too much ambiguity because, A, regulators refuse to give well-meaning actors clear guidance, and B, lawmakers refuse to act. So, obviously, you would fall into the A part of that basket, Commissioner. Why has this happened so slowly? Why can't you regulate this industry more quickly? We've been unwilling to work with people in the industry and people who are interested in, in participating in the industry to develop guidelines that make sense for the industry. We've been, we've instead preferred to take an approach that's rooted in enforcement. And often the enforcement actions come very late and they come after relatively small actors in the market. And it, it's just not a good way to, to think of, do the hard work of thinking about what a framework would actually look like. 
Do you need Congress at some level to tell you which parts of this industry you ultimately should be responsible for? I mean, is it up to you entirely or do you need some assistance from others in Washington, D.C.? That's a great point, and it would certainly be helpful to get Congress's um, decisions around who they think should be regulating in this area, if they think the SEC should be regulating these crypto trading platforms, for example, um, to get that directive from Congress would be quite helpful. You know, I'm curious here as well, because in a tweet that was a bit earlier by Elizabeth Warren, there was a mention of enforcement and a lot of reaction from the industry frustration. Brian Armstrong, Brad Garlinghouse, really kind of saying that there is no regulatory clarity, as you were kind of hinting at before. Do you think that the next couple of years will be a lot more of the same, enforcement, enforcement, and enforcement, or will there be real rules of the road after what we saw with FTX? I've been very disappointed with the way that U.S. regulators, and particularly the SEC, has approached this. It has been uh, using enforcement. And, and in some ways, it's because it's it, it changes the dynamic of the conversation if you're having it in an enforcement action versus having an open public discussion about what the right regulatory framework for this new and emerging industry is. Yes, there are places where it can slot into the existing regulatory framework, but there are areas where you do need to make adjustments. And mm -hmm. so th that has been a problematic approach. I'm really curious about what you think of a comment made earlier this week by Coinbase's CEO, Brian Armstrong, to us at Bloomberg Television. He said that he thinks that there are a lot of people in D.C. who probably feel duped or deceived by Sam Bankman-Fried. Remember, in addition to lobbying for the industry, he had also been a huge political donor. How do you think that lawmakers feel not just about Sam Bankman-Fried, but about the industry, given the, the trust that might have been breached in a situation like this? Well, I don't want to talk about any individual person or entity, but I, I will say that the the idea behind um, many of these innovations in crypto is really to move away from centralized entities or particular people and to look at on-chain development of, of innovation, on-chain activity, which is transparent, which anyone can audit you have to have the techn technical expertise to do it, but it's out there for everyone to see, can be audited, and everyone interacts with it on the same terms. That transparency and that uh, decentralized nature is what a lot of people in the industry are striving for. And so um, what happens at particular centralized entities is, is, you know, obviously it's relevant right now, and there, there are potentially a lot of people who are suffering consequences. Um, of, of the same kinds of problems that we see in the traditional financial industry. Um, but the goal is to move toward this more transparent, more decentralized, more resilient system. Have you at the SEC, Commissioner, already started receiving complaints from American investors worried that they'll not be made whole by FTX.com? Well, I think we've been seeing a lot of, a lot of concerns, um, the same concerns that others are seeing. And I mean, again, this is another area where the lack of regulatory clarity is really problematic because, you know, if we're not going to have regulatory authority, we need to tell people you have to be particularly aware that if there's a problem, there's not, you can't come to the SEC for relief. And the ambiguity has not served, has not served the American public well either. What do you think more broadly about charges um, Jamie Dimon, for example, has made, and others, about Bitcoin being a giant Ponzi scheme. If that were the case, it seems like something that the SEC would be concerned about. Markets are about people coming with their different opinions and different views on value of, of different assets and, and coming together and working that out in the marketplace. So what we should be doing as a regulator is allowing these markets to work and not standing in the way of the markets working and people mm -hmm. bringing the, those different different uh, valuation opinions there. That's what we do for other asset classes, and that's what we should do for this one as well. Considering the scale at which we've seen a lot of firms really lose customer money this year and file for bankruptcy, uh, we're not saying that's necessarily happening yet in the case of FTX. They are looking for funds, but it could be a reality if they can't get those funds secured. Do you think, Commissioner, that the tone in among regulators and with the industry has the risk of becoming more hostile than it's already been? 
I think that we can take a moment like this and use it to turn to a more productive approach. Again, this is this is not an approach that says anything goes. It's an approach that says we have these mandates to protect investors, facilitate capital formation, and and make sure the markets have integrity. We need to to make sure these mandates are being are are being abided by here. But we can work with you on the way to get there. And so this is the moment for us to take a more productive approach, and I think one that will end up being better for everyone involved. Um, so that's what I would like to see us do from this moment on. All right. Well, we appreciate your insight. Thank you so much for joining us, SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce. Uh, ending that with an optimistic, an optimistic tone, striking an optimistic tone, don't you think, Aileen? Maybe somewhat, but of course, we'll have to continue to watch and see what regulation ultimately does transpire. All right, coming up, we're going to have more on the legislative perspective and how this whole episode could change the crypto industry's relationship with Congress. Perry and Boring, founder and CEO of the Chamber for Digital Commerce, joins us next. This is Bloomberg. Probably a lot of people in DC right now kind of scratching their, their head, feeling like they got duped or deceived by this person who may um, have not had things exactly in, in order. I hope it doesn't you know, taint their view of the crypto industry broadly. That was Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong on crypto's reputation, which has taken a bit of a hit this week. Joining us now is Perry Ann Boring, founder and CEO of the Chamber for Digital Commerce. Perry Ann, great to speak with you as always. How much damage has been done to the relationship between Washington and this industry because of this episode? Yeah, I mean, I've always seen just the approach that FTX has brought in SBF personally to the conversations in Washington to be a little bit odd. The Chamber of Digital Commerce, we were established in 2014. We were the first organization in the country to advocate for the digital asset and blockchain technology ecosystem. FTX wasn't even established until five years later. So they were here much later to the game and they came out with a very aggressive ways to approach policymakers. So there's a lot of goodwill that's been done by our team at the chamber, by our members at the chamber who have relationships that supersede uh, the, the work that SBF has done, I think from a reputational perspective, I, I think it's it, it definitely uh, brings and uh, invigorates the skepticism that we have from mm. regulators and policymakers. But there's an entire industry of people on the ground in Washington educating oh. policymakers about this industry. He is not the face of the industry in Washington, and he never was. And I think that's been misreported. What what uh, what are you hearing from your members? Right? Right now, then, Perry, and I'm sure many of them are probably um, or were FTX clients, are or were uh, many of them maybe counterparties to Alameda. What are they telling you? Uh, I mean, all of our members who uh, you know had. Uh, uh, potentially had exposure to FDX. Everybody's putting out statements right now, disclosing publicly, if any, exposure to FTX, the FTT token, or any of the contagion around this. Uh, most of our members, we haven't seen uh, you know, any kind of big news from that out of our membership so far. Uh, this is really more about the customers. Uh, so these are retail investors, and that's where the biggest concern is uh, today. Uh, we are concerned about the regulatory overreach. Anytime there's a crisis or something, uh, when something goes bad, a lot of times policymakers, they tend to overreact. We've seen instances similar to this before. There was Mt. Gox in 2013. Mm. We were, we, the chamber was established during the aftermath of Mt. Gox. And what came out of that? We got the New York bit license. So we wouldn't want to see a similar reaction because, you know, there was one bad actor, one bad event. Mm -hmm. We want policymaking to be done in an informed way, not based on fear. So that is our priority. 
priority to ensure that we are fully understanding what's happened here and make sure that any policy responses are done uh, in a way that truly uh, addresses gaps in disclosure regi right. regimes and, and not based out of fear. To that, to that you know, I, I hear it in, in your answer here. Are you saying that lawmakers are at risk of not really trusting a lot of members of the industry anymore after how much money has been lost in this FTX.com issue. Do you think that some of these uh, changes will face a setback for a while? I, I mean, has trust been lost? I mean, I, at the end of the day, this is an, off, uh, an, an overseas entity, right, where this, this has spurred from. Uh, and we just heard from SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce, who really enforced this point, which is this industry has operated in regulatory uncertainty for a long time. We have been clamoring, the chamber, our members, the industry has been asking for regulatory clarity for, for years. And that has forced so much activity overseas. And that's really been to the detriment of American investors uh, and particularly retail investors. So mm -hmm. it's really important that we have a regulatory framework that's not enforcement focused. This isn't totally, you know, I don't want to place all the blame on the policymakers because we did have an unusual situation here. And even if we had perfect policy, right. you can't plan or mitigate against a bad actor in all circumstances. Uh, but I do believe mm -hmm. if we had taken a more thoughtful approach to policymaking in the U.S., we could have mitigated the response this week. Okay, so let's talk about policymaking then, because as all this crypto chaos was going on, it's almost easy to forget that we had midterm elections here in the U.S. on Tuesday. And of course, we still don't ultimately know what the composition of Congress is going to look like, but how optimistic are you that something bipartisan could get done on crypto legislation in the new Congress? It's very, it's very possible. We will likely uh, have uh, a divided Congress, you know, regardless of uh, which party ends up taking control of which chamber. It, it will be by very slim margins. There is bipartisan support, and actually some policymakers will say this is a nonpartisan issue. There's a difference between bipartisan and nonpartisan. A lot will say crypto is non. Partisan. This is about technology, right? This is no different than the internet, than electricity, than mobile phones, uh, or PCs. So a lot of policymakers understand from the technology perspective, it's important that mm -hmm. we have regulatory frameworks that encourage the U.S. to be a leader in this space, Marianne. and that's going to be important for competitiveness Marianne. going forward. But I guess what actually happened here, because when we saw CZ tweeting over the weekend, he was saying that part of this was because he couldn't really support somebody who was lobbying against him and we've been hearing a little bit of that that FTX you know was not necessarily looking out for the industry but themselves can you quickly explain here you know less than a minute sorry about that but what happened uh, it does appear that uh, there were some crypto politics at play as well I mean you're seeing the same things I'm seeing but uh, it, the, the crypto exchange market has always been very cutthroat and very competitive. Did that play a hand in the unraveling this week? It's very possible. All right, Perry, and we have to leave it there, but thank you so much for joining us. Perry Ann Boring of the Chamber of Digital Commerce. And thank you as well to Shanali Vasek for joining us this hour. If you can't get enough of crypto, also make sure to check out our Bloomberg Crypto Podcast, which dives deeper than the daily market buzz to explore how this asset class is changing the way we live. Look for that every week through the Bloomberg Professional app, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Crypto. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lyons. I'd say about 14 years ago, I got off a plane from Germany on September 15, 2008, turned on my BlackBerry only to see that Lehman Brothers had collapsed. The exact same thing <laughs> happened to me on Tuesday. I got off a flight at JFK and I turned on, well, my iPhone at this time, Mom. and I saw this FTX store. I couldn't believe it. I yeah. Mean, 
blown. Absolutely mind blown. I mean, I don't think any of us saw this coming because SBF was the white knight. He was saving everybody else, and now he finds himself in a position of needing to be saved. We know that he is looking for potentially billions of dollars of funding to raise in order to rescue FTX. We know that Tron, Justin Sun, has been in talks. We don't know for the amount, but it'll be interesting to see how this evolves. And if he can't get it done, what do those ripple effects look like? It's it, it's really a moment of contention for this industry. Yeah, I'm also really focused on something that Shanali and Jim Bianco were talking about. If Alameda winds down, what does the counterparty exposure then look like? And how long do those ripples um, cascade, to use a JP Morgan phrase, through the system? Because it could yeah. be very bad. But right now, it's looking like it's not the total catastrophe enough to bring markets down, right? We're still rallying very hard. Uh, in traditional finance and on plain vanilla markets. Yeah, well, a lot of that probably has to do with CPI. Clearly a lot going on. We're going to keep talking about this here on Bloomberg Crypto. We'll be back in our normal time slot next week, Tuesday, 1 p.m. Eastern time, right here on Bloomberg.